This is Jared Horak for the TheRunawayHorse.com. This is my final look at the 2022 Preakness Stakes. I'm going to go through the field and I'm going to give out my top choice in this video. Now, if you're interested in my full card analysis for Preakness Day uh, from Pimlico, uh, that is available right now at the TheRunawayHorse.com on my sales page. I finished that Saturday, May 21st, 14 race full card, and you can purchase that now. Some other products that I'm offering uh, for Preakness Week, I'm doing the Black Eyed Susan Day Stakes Races. That's also available now uh, at the TheRunawayHorse.com for Friday, May 20th of the Preakness Day full card. I mentioned that. If you just want the Preakness analysis only, you can get that. And then the other uh, product I have, uh, if you're interested in getting Preakness Day and Belmont Stakes Day, if you buy those two full cards together, you get a discount instead of buying them separately. So head on over to the TheRunawayHorse.com on my sales page for that information. I'm also offering full cards from Santa Anita Park as well. Now, I've, I've had some good success in the Preakness Stakes the last few years. Had the nice Superfecta last year. Had Exaggerator a few years ago. I've had some Exactas, uh, Trifectas, and Superfectas. So I've had a lot of success over the years. I've been covering this race since, uh, or following racing since 1980. I've been covering uh, Preakness uh, Day for full cards probably since uh, the late 1990s. So I've done a lot of these full cards. Had a lot of success at Pimlico. It's, it was my uh, hometown track. I know a lot about Pimlico, and, and I am always enjoy the Preakness Stakes. Uh, so all that stuff is available uh, right now if you're interested. Now, before uh, we get into the analysis of this video, I'm just going to quickly go through a few angles uh, that, that you should be looking for uh, for Preakness Day 2022. And one of the things, uh, first off, it's, it's going to be very hot this year. Typically, that's not the case. It's supposed to be mostly sunny and 96 degrees. So it's going to be very hot. We'll have to see how the horses handle that heat and how the track's playing as well. A lot of times, this is like more of a summertime weather pattern that we're going to have uh, in Baltimore uh, for for Black Eyed Susan Day and Preakness Day, both days in the 90s. So watch those Friday races, see how the track plays, and then Saturday as well. A lot of times in the summer on the East Coast, you see a lot of speed horses do well uh, when you get those tracks that that, that, that get baked and, and they dry out. So we'll have to see how it all uh, plays out. Uh, but keep an eye on that uh, for Friday to see how the track bias is, and then into Saturday as well. Now some recent angles in the Preakness Stakes now, this, this one's interesting. I just, found, I just find this angle interesting. Since 1962, horses that finished second in the Kentucky Derby are just three for 41 in the Preakness Stakes, with 12 runner-up finishes and nine show finishes. Now, those three winners, Summer Squall in 1990, Prairie Bayou in 1993, and in my top choice, Exaggerator in 2016. Now, Epicenter was the runner-up uh, this year. He's going to be the heavy favorite in this race. Uh, he's got a very good chance to win. I just thought that was an interesting angle. Uh, only three for 41 uh, for, for Derby runner-ups. Uh, now, new shooters, horses that did not run in the Kentucky Derby, and then they run in the Preakness Stakes. Uh, since 1980, we've had nine new shooters win the Preakness. And three of the last five years, horses that did not run in the Kentucky Derby won the Preakness Stakes. Cloud Computing for Chad Brown in 2017. Swiss Skydiver for Ken McPeak. The Philly in 2020, and then Rumbauer last year. Uh, he he was one that finished third in the Bluegrass Stakes, and he did not run in the Derby, and then he won the Preakness Stakes. And he qualified for the Preakness. He got a free trip, uh, a free berth to the Preakness uh, for winning the El Camino Real Derby at Golden Gate Fields. Uh, so you could certainly see that fresh horses can win uh, the Preakness Stakes. Now we'll go through the field, and, and this is going to be the 13th race at Pimlico for Saturday, May 21st. 2022, the Grade One 1.5 million dollar Preakness Stakes for three year olds for three year olds traveling a mile and three sixteenths on the main track, and the scheduled post time for the Preakness this year is 7:01 p.m. Eastern time. Simplification is number one. He is six to one morning line, and I think if you're playing exotic wagers, at the very least you you have to use him because he just tries so hard. He's had eight career starts with three wins, a second, and two thirds. He's earned more than six hundred thousand dollars. He can. He he's one that started out as a sprinter. He battled on the pace in a Florida bred sprint race at Gulfstream Park last fall, and he broke his maiden by 16 lengths. He worked his way into Stakes Company, the Mucho Macho Man Stakes, on January 1st. He wired the field there. That was not a Kentucky Derby points race, but his next start was the Grade Three Holy Bull. That was a productive race, and he rallied from seventh to finish second. White Abario won that one easily. He finished in, in front of Mo Donegal. 
and he blew the brake. We, uh, anybody that was handicapping that race, it looked like he was going to be the speed after his wire-to-wire -wire win in the Mucho Macho Man stakes. But then uh, he blew the brake that day, and he rallied, and he tried hard to finish second. The Fountain of Youth stakes, he rallied again. The pace was quick. He sat back. He rallied outside. He won that one easily. In the Florida Derby, he dueled on the lead, and he ended up finishing a clear third. Then in the Kentucky Derby, the pace was ridiculous there. They were going 21 and change for the opening quarter. And Simplification rallied from 15th place to finish fourth at 35 to 1 odds. Now, he won't be 35 to 1 this time. And, he, and they can kind of place him anywhere. As you can see, he just tries hard every time. And he'll use, it doesn't matter if the pace is, is fast or, or slow or whatever it is. He, he, he can adjust his running style and he just tries hard to the end. So he's one that I think you can definitely use in exotics. And he could be, a, 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 he would produce a mild upset if he won, but I wouldn't be shocked if that happened. The two creative minister for trader Ken McPeak, uh, they supplemented this horse to this race for $150,000. So they must think they have a decent shot. And, and he's definitely, um, he has a lot of potential. He's only run three times in his career debut at seven furlongs. He rallied from 10th place to miss by a neck. That was on March 5th. So he's, he's, he's just started his career. And then on April 9th in the slop at a mile and a 16th at Keeneland, he rallied from fourth in a 12 horse field, stalking that pace. And he won nicely by a length and a half. Got a fast track on the Kentucky Derby undercard on May 7th. Optional claiming company. He rallied from the seventh place and he won easily by almost three lengths. His speed figures are on the improve, uh, creative cause the sire, uh, tap at the damn sire. So he's got a nice pedigree. They paid 160000 for this one in the 2020 Keeneland sales. He's got enough tactical speed to stay within hailing distance. And at 10 to 1, he's a little bit interesting. Number three, Fenwick. He's a 50 to 1 long shot. And he looks overmatched in here. But we probably said the same thing about Rich Strike in the Kentucky Derby. And he pulled off that massive upset there when the pace collapsed. Now, Fenwick was one that just at the last minute they decided to enter this horse. And I think part of it is because there wasn't a lot of pace on paper. And maybe they thought they could get away with uh, getting him uh, close to the lead in here, uh, like he did in his maiden win at a mile and 40 yards at Tampa Bay on a good track on May 12th. And that day, he just got out there from post one. He controlled the pace. He won by more than five lengths. Command performance, highly regarded um, Todd Pletcher trainee, was the heavy favorite there. And he could not get close to Fenwick that day. And then Fenwick in the bluegrass stakes, he made a middle move from 7th to 4th, then he weakened, he finished 11th, beating 36 lengths. Now his, his pace figures are not quick enough to get to the front, his, and his maiden speed figure uh, is still not fast enough. Uh, I think all the other entrants in this field have a faster speed figure, so he's going to really have to step up his game. He looks overmatched in this spot, and I don't think he can get the lead either. Number four, Secret Oath, uh, Wayne Lucas's Philly, 9-2 to two morning line. Well, the sire, arrogant, quiet, American, the damn sire. She's five for eight lifetime with two show finishes, and uh, she's already earned uh, more than $1.29 million in her career. Uh, she's really, when she's, won when she's winning, she's winning very nicely, uh, like she did in her maiden win when she won by five at Churchill. Uh, Oakland Park Optional Claiming Company, she won by eight. And the what Martha Washington Stakes, she won by seven. Another seven-length win in the Honey Bee. She tried the males in the Arkansas Derby. Uh, she made a wide premature move there, and she just uh, ended up third, uh, in a clear third that day. She just missed second. Uh, and then she bounced back in the Kentucky Oaks with another win, uh, rallying from off the pace from the inside post. They purposely got her off the inside, moved her outside, and that outside trip was the key there because Nest was the favorite, and she wanted to be outside, but she could never make it outside. So that Secret oath from that inside post made it outside and she won nicely. Now she's coming back in two weeks and we'll see if she can duplicate her last. Uh, number five, early voting, seven to two morning line for Chad Brown. This one had enough points to run in the Kentucky Derby, but Chad Brown always wanted to skip the Derby and point to the Preakness because he thought a horse with three starts so lightly raced was just not, did not have enough experience for the Kentucky Derby. And he looks very smart after that decision because the way the pace played out, early voting likes to be on the pace. He would have been cooked on that Kentucky Derby pace. His one-mile debut at, late last year at Aqueduct, he dueled on the lead. He won nicely. The grade three Withers stakes in the mud. He just took over early, and he just dominated that race. Un Ojo, your runner-up finisher there, came back and won the grade two Rebel. And then in the Wood Memorial, he got out there and he controlled the pace. 
Uh, but Mo Donegal ran him down, having a great inside closing trip. Um, uh, he has a lot of, uh, like I said, he has a lot of ability. Only three starts. Uh, this son of gun runner, Tisnow, the dam sire. Chad Brown did not want to run him against 20 horses last time. Much shorter field with less pace. He should make his presence felt throughout. Number six, Happy Jack has not been successful in the stakes ranks. He broke his maiden in January at Santa Anita at six furlongs. But since then, the Robert Lewis stakes, he was beaten 27 lengths. He's beaten 10 lengths, finishing third in the San Felipe. He was third, beaten 12 lengths in the Santa Anita Derby. In the Kentucky Derby, he was beaten 19 lengths back in 14th place. He's putting blinkers on. Tyler Gaffalione is his new rider. And I guess a, a minor word wouldn't be impossible just because after we saw in the Kentucky Derby as well, we've seen a lot of these races. You'll see long shots sneak in there. Wouldn't be shocked if he finished third or fourth. Just does a win would be very surprising. Uh, Armagnac is number seven for trainer Tim Yakteen. He's 12 to one morning line. Another late addition to this race because of the lack of pace. They decided to throw him in there. And he's one that looked good in his maiden win going wire to wire in January. He was beaten 27 lengths in the San Felipe Stakes. He was beaten 12 lengths in the San Anita Derby. And then they took blinkers off in, in an optional claiming race in a six-horse field. He was able to get out there and control the pace, and he won easily by four lengths. Um, High Connection was the heavy favorite there. He was he was second best. Uh, so Armagnac's going to try to impact the pace under his new rider, Irat Ortiz Jr. He does have the pace figures to make an impact early, but he's coming back uh, even less than two weeks because he ran, his last win was the day after the Kentucky Derby. And now he's got to ship all the way across the country as well. Epicenter is your heavy morning line favorite at 6-5. to five. He's going to go off lower than that. He's really done nothing wrong in his career. Seven wins, um, seven starts, four wins, two seconds. He's earned more than $1.6 million in his career. Broke his maiden at Churchill Downs easily, right up on the pace. He jumped into a Kentucky Derby points race in his third career start after breaking his maiden second time out. And in that gun runner stakes at fairgrounds, he battled on the pace and he won by six. In the LeCompte stakes, he did all the pace dirty work. He was battling on the pace. He turned away all the other foes except Call Me Midnight, who tagged him on the line. He ran too good to lose there. In the Risen Star stakes, he controlled the pace. That was a productive race. He won that one easily. A show finisher, Zandon, did come back and win the Bluegrass Stakes, and then Zandon was third in the Kentucky Derby epicenter last time out. Um, in the Louisiana Derby, in his final start before the Kentucky Derby, he showed that he could stalk and pounce instead of uh, going to the lead. And that day, very nicely handled under Joel Rosario. He stalked from third, he took over, he won that one easily. In the Kentucky Derby, the pace was ridiculous. He was sitting back in eighth, he got to the lead. Uh, passing all those tired horses. And when he got the lead, Zandon was coming after him. Then he had to hold that one off, and he did. He was able to hold Zandon off, but he could not hold off. Rich Strike snuck up the inside and pulled off a huge upset. He ran a winning race in the Kentucky Derby, and if he can run back anywhere near that, uh, he's certainly going to be the horse to beat. Finally, number nine, Skippy Longstocking. He's 20-1 to 1 morning line for Safi Joseph Jr., and his speed figures really jumped up at a mile and an eighth in his last two starts. Most of his uh, first seven starts, all but one, were one-turn races. So then when he got able, when he was able to get out around two turns uh, at Gulfstream Park on March 2nd, he rallied from fourth, nine lanes back to win, going away. And then in the Wood Memorial Stakes, the pace wasn't that quick. Early voting was controlling that pace, and he ended up stalking from fifth, and he finished a clear third. So that was a decent effort. He's one I think you can use in your exotics. He's, his speed figures jumped up. He's got some tactical stalking speed, and he can work out a trip while out in the clear. Now, Epicenter, clearly the one to beat. The only possible thing that I could say that, that could do him in was that taxing race in the Kentucky Derby. And then also, he's been going uh, in steady training since last fall. I mean, he, he ran in, the, like, in a lot of points races, the gun rider, the Lecomte, Risen Star, Louisiana Derby, Kentucky Derby. He ran well in all of those races. How many times can he just keep coming back and running a big race? And then he's coming back in two weeks as well. But I have no knocks on this horse. He's done nothing wrong. He's got a great post. He's got early pressing speed. They can do whatever they want. Joel Rosario can watch the pace unfold inside of him and then decide what to do. So Epicenter, clearly the one to beat. And I don't blame anybody for picking him on top. Uh, but I'm going to go with uh, early voting as my top choice for the for the Preakness Stakes this year. He's the only horse uh, 
out of the main contenders that's not coming back in two weeks. He's had six weeks in between starts. And in all of his races, he's had very good spacing. He started his career on December 18th, and then he didn't run again until February 5th. And then he ran on April 9th. So he's had good spacing in between all of his starts. And that's one of the things that Chad Brown wanted to do. Uh, that's why he didn't want to run in the Kentucky Derby as well. He wanted better spacing. Uh, he wanted a race uh, with less horses, less pace, and a little bit of a shorter distance. And he gets all of that. Maybe he catches these horses at the right time. He had a bullet workout on May 13th. And I think that he's just ready to get out there and run a good race. Now, if he can get out there and control the pace, he could be tough to catch. Uh, but Epicenter's never going to be that far back, and I would not be surprised if he won at all. But I'm going to go with uh, early voting. He looks a lot like cloud computing for Chad Brown. Uh, that one only had three starts at Aqueduct as well, and he comes in with almost the identical pattern and early voting with that decent speed figure in the Wood Memorial. And then Mo Donegal ended up beating him there, and then Mo Donegal was not disgraced in the Kentucky Derby, rallying very wide to finish fifth. And then, as I said, Unoho, who he beat, uh, came back and won uh, the the um, Rebel Stakes. And then Mo Donegal was competitive and actually defeated Zandon. And then Zandon's one of the top three-year-olds this year. So early voting has some company lines that says he can run with this kind of company. And I think uh, maybe he can wire the field in here. So early voting is my top choice over Epicenter in the 2022 Preakness Stakes. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment if you like this content. And that will wrap up this video. Again, Head on over to therunawayhorse.com, all my full card and any of that information. If you're interested in any of that, uh, feel free to go over there and, and, and purchase those. I work very hard on these full cards, and hopefully I can have a lot of good winners. I had a lot of success on Kentucky Derby Day with six top choice winners. Let's see, in, these, in the 14 race Kentucky Derby and Preakness Day full card, if I can have even more success and get the Preakness home as well and get some nice winning tickets there. Uh, so that'll wrap up this video. I'll be back next week. I'll recap the Preakness and I'll start previewing the Belmont Stakes. Until then, good luck at the races. Good luck, Preakness Saturday. <laughs>